gospel itself. For example, the Old Testament said that the Old Testament priesthood, the Levitical priesthood, is perpetual. It's eternal. I can guarantee you there are no Levitical priests at Mr. Perkins' church. So if he's going to be consistent, he has to recognize that those Old Testament paradigms must be seen in light of New Testament fulfillment. You don't make the Old Testament something that this is the final revelation and now there can be nothing more in the New Testament. He doesn't do that in many areas of his worship and belief. Why does he do it in this area? It's because of a specific tradition. Uh, I, we did hear a, a discussion of the book from, the, I think it was from Isaiah, where God talks about his hand. And then in John chapter 10, why do the Jews pick up stones to stone Jesus? Because he has said, he gives eternal life to his people. No one can snatch them out of his hand. The Father who is greater than all, no one can snatch them out of his, fan, his hand. I and the Father, we are one. Plural verb. S men, we are one. Not I is one. The whole point of the statement, John 10, and the comment that I made that was quoted in partial uh, by Mr. Perkins was that the oneness spoken of is not a oneness of person. It is a oneness of purpose in the salvation of God's people, and that's where the evidence of the deity of Christ from that text even comes from. Also, what I criticized Mr. Perkins for was standing before a group of people and upbraiding his opponent, saying, you don't even know what the Greek term is. When the fact of the matter is, if he looked up Heis in Bauer, Arndt, Gingrich, and Donker, he looked it up under Heis. If he looked up Hen, guess what he looked it under? Heis. If he looked up Mia, what did he look under? Mia. Every first-year Greek student knows Heis, Mia, Hen is the lexical form of the singular ordinal. That's how you learn it when you learn Greek. That was the whole point of my raising those issues. When I talked about lexical abuse... Now, I'm not going to project it up here. I could uh, if we wanted to, if we wanted to plug in and take the time to do that. But I could show you lexicons. Bauer, Arndt, Gingrich, and Donker is the current standard Bauer, Gar B. Dag now. They've, they've changed it to the second to third edition. That lexicon is the standard edition. When you read it, it gives you multiple meanings depending upon usage. It gives you a general meaning, and then the lexicon, if it is a complete lexicon, will break down the meaning and apply the specific meanings in particular texts. Many times what Mr. Perkins is doing is taking the general meaning, not even looking at how the lexicon actually applies its own interpretation and saying, ah, there it is. My friends, when you study lexical semantics, you discover that every word has a meaning in its context. And if you're going to take a general meaning and cram it in there, then you better be prepared to look at syntax and verbal forms and everything else that comes along with it because that's what serious translation of the Greek New Testament involves. Um, he, he mentioned that I said, well, you, you, I, the masculine singer refers to personhood. Yes, I was contrasting the fact that generally when the Greek uses a masculine term, it is referring to a person. And when it uses a neuter term, it refers either to a group together or to some other concept. I was discussing the general use of that. It is a valid term, and I would defend that in my discussion of those particular texts. Then we had long lists of people that say, well, they translated this as one person. And if you looked, if you took the time to look, we're talking about Galatians 3.20. Now, a mediator is not for one, whereas God is one. Now, what does that mean? A mediator is not for, and the New American Standard says, one party only, whereas God is only one. And so what is being discussed there? Why would anyone be talking about this? He's talking about the fact that this idea of mediation involves two parties. He's talking about mediation. He's not discussing the Godhead. He's not asserting Unitarianism. And I can guarantee you when it says, well, the Amplified Bible says one person. I work for the Lockman Foundation. We published it. I can guarantee you, we're not Unitarians. That's not what we intended to communicate by that translation. And my dad studied under Kenneth Wiest, and I can guarantee you Kenneth Wiest was a Trinitarian, not a Unitarian. All right? So what do we have then? Let's refocus because we need to. Folks, what's the thesis? The thesis is, did the Son exist as a divine person prior to his incarnation in Bethlehem? 
What's the only place in the Bible that's going to give us certain knowledge of that, but the very text that address the relationship of the Father and the Son, which is in the New Testament? Is the argument tonight, we can't look at Philippians 2, we can't look at John 1, we can't look at John 17, because the Old Testament won't let us, because we can't go past the Old Testament in our revelation of who God is. Is that the argument this evening? I certainly hope not. And one of my disappointments right now is it would be difficult, I would think, in 15 minutes for Mr. Perkins to even provide a meaningfully full exegesis of those three texts, which we must have. I submit to you if the argument is, well, it can't mean what he said because of what I said. That is not a meaningful scholarly argument. We need to hear that if all that is true, if using 9,000 singular pronouns means that Unitarianism is true rather than monotheism is true. I say it means monotheism is true. If that's what it means, then we still need to know what these texts are about. And it needs to come from a deep exegesis of the text. None of that has been touched as yet. One of my favorite verses was cited, and that was Colossians chapter 2, verse 9. For in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. Hati enalto katoikai panta pleroma teis theate tas somatikos. Beautiful, beautiful text. I believe it. But you see, I read it in its context. The context is an anti-Gnostic polemic. And you see, before you ever get to Colossians 2.9, you've already read Colossians 1. And Colossians 1 has already differentiated the Son from the Father. And it has already told us that the Son is divine, not a mere human being. It is said that we have been transferred into the kingdom of his Son. And then in describing the Son, it says, by the Son... All things are created, whether in heaven and earth, visible or invisible, principalities, powers, dominions, or authorities. All things are created by him and for him. And in him, all things sunestic him. They hold together. That's the sun, folks. And that was said before Colossians 2.9. So you've got to allow that to happen. How can the sun be the one? who created all things. Paul exhausts the Greek language. He exhausts the number of prepositions he could use to say that Jesus is the creator. And then when he says in Colossians 2.9, for in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. Is that making him the father? Is that making him the spirit? No. What we believe is is that each of the divine persons shares fully the one being that is God. God's being can't be cut into parts. God's being is on a pie that's been cut into three pieces. And since the Son truly is deity, the creator of all things, yet distinguished from the Father, but since the Son is truly deity, then we are not to be taken, of, taken captive by empty philosophy, vain traditions. He is to be the standard of all things because in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. That would have been like scratching, this isn't a chalkboard, so it doesn't work anymore. But if that was a chalkboard, I went back there and I ran my fingernails down. Those are the older people in the audience are going, oh, the younger people are going, what? What's he doing? I don't understand. <laughs> Colossians 2.9 would be like pulling your fingers down a chalkboard to a Gnostic because he's just said the pleroma, the fullness of that which makes God, God, deity, dwelt bodily, not just dwelt, but is dwelling bodily in Jesus. That's a present tense. And so I'd like to ask Mr. Perkins a question. If that makes Jesus the father and now Jesus is now the deity is the spirit or however it is he understands that. This says that at the time Paul wrote this, all the fullness of deity is dwelling in Jesus bodily. Is that union still there or has the father become the spirit and is now dwelling us? I don't know. I'll leave that to Mr. Perkins to respond to. Let's listen if we get full exegesis of those key texts in the next 15 minutes. Thank you for your attention.